Hi, everybody. We're slowly letting everyone in. Uh, we'll get started in just a couple of minutes. We just want to let um, give people a couple more minutes to log on. If you would like, um, you are able to rename yourself. It looks like people generally see, I see people's names, so that's good. If you want to rename yourself and you don't know how, just so we can know who's on the call, you can hover over your icon either in the video or in the chat. Um, you can go to those three little dots over your icon and go to rename if you'd like to do that or if you'd like to add pronouns. All right. So we have a presentation tonight that will be about 30 minutes long with time for questions and answers. So if you have any questions throughout the night, you can add those into the chat. Uh, to open up the chat window, you can hover over your screen, open, click that chat icon. You can type your questions there. We have people monitoring the chat and we'll address those at the end. This, um, this event is being recorded. So for recording integrity, if you could please make sure you stay muted throughout the presentation. Um, you can come off video once we get to the Q&A's, but for now, for recording sake, um, we ask that people just stay off video for now. So tonight's presentation is from Margie Reese from MJR Partners, who has been our independent consultant leading our teams through this work. Um, we'll have time for questions at the end but we do have a prompt closing time at 8 p.m. for just so everyone can head to the debate in time. I know everyone's excited about that. So I'm Kamiko, I'll be the MC facilitator tonight. I am a cultural funding specialist on the cultural funding team within the cultural arts division. Um, so if I could get the cultural arts division staff to come off camera for a second, say hello. They are with us tonight, and we are led by Megan Wells. We also have music and entertainment with us tonight. Um, there they are, as well as our Heritage Tourism Division. Heritage Tourism is led by Melissa Alvarado. Music Entertainment is led by Erica Shamily. And I'm going to pass it off to Solnovia holt Rab, our Interim Director of the Economic Development Department. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome. On behalf of Veronica Bersinio, our Chief Recovery Officer, myself, along with Susanna Carvajal, we are the executive team that has the pleasure to lead all of these divisions, along with two, three other divisions. And again, we're just excited that you're here tonight. We're going to be continuing our conversation around building an equitable process leading intentionally with racial equity for not only our cultural arts division, but heritage and also music. So we're excited that you're here. We want to hear from you on what we have uh, heard through our listening session in consultation with our consultant, Margie Reese. And since we're limited on time, without further ado, again, I just want to say thank you on behalf of our leadership team and we look forward to continuing the conversation. Margie, it's all yours. Thank you, Silnovia. Uh, it's, I, I wish I could say it's good to see all of you, but uh, it's good to be back in Austin and continuing uh, these very important conversations about uh, change management uh, as the city looks forward uh, to focusing its work on racial equity. And I want to start by saying that, oh dear, I knew this was going to happen to me. Um, I want to start by saying that um, we took a look, a very close look at um, the city's definition of racial equity. 
definitions was one of the first uh, calls for action that we heard when we began these conversations. The public wanted to know, what do you mean by? So rather than creating a definition, we wanted to share with you this definition, which is the adopted um, definition of racial equity uh, from the city's uh, equity office. Racial equity is the condition where race no longer predicts a person's quality of life or outcomes in our community. The city recognizes that race is a primary determinant of social equity, and therefore we begin the journey toward social equity with this definition. And so it has been, this definition has been at the foreground of uh, how we responded to the conversations and questions that we've been hearing throughout um, our listening uh, sessions. And wanted to, gosh, you guys are gonna have to excuse me because this worked a minute ago. Um, wanted to start the conversation by sharing with you um, what we understand the opportunities are and a little bit more about um, the goal of our work as a consulting team. So working with the staff and the, the man leadership of the Economic Development Department, one of the central goals is to create alignment across the three divisions. So let's look at the challenges that we heard from our listening sessions with the community. That with each of the three divisions, there seems to be an overly complicated grant process and procedures. That there are many organizations that are successful in moving through these processes if they've been grantees for a long period of time and others um, who are challenged by some of the requirements that the city um, has in place. And so we've been looking at taking a look at those and seeing where we could lower some of those barriers to access. We also heard that one of the challenges in the city of Austin is this concept of cultural equity and access that there seems to have been a period of time or some historic um, um, actions that have limited access to cultural resources evenly across the board. Another challenge, of course, that we're hearing is the challenge of bureaucracy. We're gonna have to learn how to live with bureaucracy because the key funder in this case is city government. And in order for city governments to deliver on its promises to the public, it has to have systems that can be accountable to the public at large. And another challenge that we heard and see um, is that there is some uh, resistance to acknowledging that bias exists within the cultural sector. And what we mean by that is we've heard people rationalizing why other organizations, some organizations should get funded over others. Uh, on the opposite side of the screen um, are opportunities for this alignment to happen. Opportunities for doing a better job at showcasing Austin's multifaceted creative sector. Um, there are a lot of hidden gems that we've been discovering, particularly among communities of color and individual artists um, that have not been able to withstand the challenges of going through the systems and the processes to successfully compete for funding. There's an opportunity here to create a general and better understanding of the hot tax legislation. These three divisions, as you know, are funded by tourism dollars. And the ultimate goal uh, of our work is to increase uh, tourism, notwithstanding the fact that we are now in the, in the time of isolation uh, right now, but we're gonna come out of that time. And so part of our stance should be that we are ready to receive visitors and tourists back into the city to continue to refuel these funds and to grow them. Another really important opportunity here is um, for this process to help identify ways to develop cultural institutions that represent um, people of color. And what we mean by that um, uh, institutions are asset-based organizations that have permanent access to facilities or permanent professional staff um, to have consistent programming that's uninterrupted. So organizations that are funded more on, a, on an operational level uh, as opposed to a, a program by program level. 
And then we have an opportunity to work toward eliminating bias in the cultural sector, eliminating racial bias in particular, um, and how do we work toward that kind of, of um, situation is, is a big part of what we're aiming to do. And so as we launched uh, a year ago almost, um, our community conversations with mostly at that point, um, organizations that fell under the cultural arts division, we've continued to uh, have conversations with music commissioners, um, organizations that fall under the music, live music and entertainment division, as well as heritage tourism, which is a big uh, part of our new thinking about how we open up the doors to arts and culture to include heritage. And so just wanna share with you a little bit about what we heard during those conversations. Um, we heard that traditional white led institutions struggle to accept the fact that historic inequities exist in arts funding in the city. Um, you could unpack that on your own, but we could talk about that more, but we, there was a great deal of pushback um, that we heard historically, the white led organizations that were here for the longer period of time feel that there should be some kind of um, entitlement for their having done a lot of the groundwork to build the cultural infrastructure of the city. And that has some validity to it. Um, we also took a critical review of the grant making and contracting systems as we heard organizations talking about uh, the numbers of times that they had to redo or their, their feeling that the grant panel process didn't allow them much flexibility, um, how the funding process from beginning of the contract to actual receiving the funding was sometimes um, frustrating. Um, we heard a lot about well-intended initiatives. Uh, this has to do with adding a program to respond to a certain population group. So adding more layers that will target communities um, just to satisfy that population group for a time. Um, those well-intended programs have created more marginalization. So we have major categories of funding and then we have the other. We heard that uh, space for production and presentation of visual and performing arts programs in Austin is becoming uh, more and more of a problem, becoming more expensive uh, spaces are being taken away. Uh, private development is a, is a, a growth opportunity for the city, uh, but also has, is creating some uh, scarcity of performing arts and visual arts spaces. We heard that protecting neighborhoods, uh, culturally specific neighborhoods and districts uh, is a priority. Um, we could see over time as we led conversations, particularly uh, in neighborhoods where, where once were thriving Latino or African-American communities, that those neighborhoods historically are being eradicated. Um, we also heard that, oh dear, um, I can't go back, you guys, bear with me. Uh, so based on this quick summary of what we heard, um, we're also uh, understanding that we could come to you with 20 different recommendations. Um, but we did a good job of trying to synthesize a lot of what we heard to bring back to you tonight um, the, the recommendations that are gonna frame the actual implementation strategies uh, that we'll be bringing to, to the city. And so three high level recommendations uh, are derived from uh, our conversations across the three divisions. And as an intro to each one of these recommendations, um, I wanna share an observation that will help us ground um, the recommendation that we're gonna hear next. And it is simply this, if Austin's racially diverse history is not addressed with intentionality, the generative nature of the creative sector will dramatically decline. And this observation comes to you because we're seeing this sort of out migration of artists of color, particularly musicians um, who leave the city, um, actors and theater professionals who can't find the kind of work that is satisfying to their career um, are leaving the city because they don't have spaces and institutions 
that will welcome uh, their work. And so the recommendation here is uh, that the city should invest in the creative sector to nurture and protect the artistic expressions of Austin's racially and culturally diverse communities. And that means that there will need to be some really specific um, alignment with leadership development um, to advance arts administration practices. That this is gonna be important because as we're looking at what the guidelines look like and the barriers look like um, to accessing public funding, um, a lot of times uh, organizations of color in particular don't have the full-time arts administration staff to move through uh, the bureaucratic systems, the guidelines, the policies and strategies. But on the other hand, um, we also need to look at citizen leadership. We heard a great deal of frustration about review panels and how panelists are selected, the process that they are trained or not trained. Um, we've heard um, a lot of conversation about commissions and their roles, um, advisory groups, emerging leaders, so the people part of our work and how can we help strengthen the practices and principles of the individuals that are involved in, in decision making. We're also considering under this recommendation a need to investigate external partner relationships. Um, and by that, we simply mean that the city cannot do it all. The city cannot be depended upon to provide all of the resources that will be required to shift a little bit um, more if the hot tax funds are going to um, increase tourism, if that's our goal. We're gonna need to do a lot more work coaching, understanding language of tourism, more financial planning, and designating perhaps a few organizations to be a part of a, a learning cohort. So as a community, we can understand better how to raise arts administration practices within the sector. There will need to be some professional development for the uh, economic development staff so that they can lead workshops uh, around cultural diversity action planning. This is one of the things that we also heard from white led organizations, but it's also going to be important for all of the organizations that receive funding from the city to take more seriously um, the, the requirement for actually building step by step uh, work plans to achieve racial equity. We can't leave it to chance any longer. And if we're asking for marketing um, plans to be created, the city will also need to co-create um, what we're calling an asset-based or strength-based messages that describe the full and the full complement of cultural resources that are available to the city. So uh, in, a, in other words, marketing the larger institutions is critically important, but also making sure that there are assets in the city that may be smaller community-based organizations that the visiting public is interested in seeing and participating in. And perhaps also considering how we develop uh, culturally specific organizations and partners, contractors, and create maybe a suite of arts management sessions um, that we can actually test some arts management investment in. All of these recommendations and the ones to come, of course, will be much more um, spelled out ultimately as we continue to do uh, the, the work. The second um, observation that's preceding our next recommendation um, is that it should be considered a high level goal for Austin to retain and grow its cultural infrastructure so that its citizens can share in the economic and employment benefits of heritage preservation and the creative sector. We heard this a great deal and it was a very important point brought to us by uh, members of the Music Commission um, that there are jobs and careers outside of the performing arts and those jobs are being um, are being taken uh, by individuals that come into the city 
uh, institutions that move in with performances and move out, especially as we think about um, employment and the future employment in the cultural sector as a whole. Where are young, our young people being guided to participate um, in the arts? How do we make sure that our residents have the kind of training um, and access to jobs, in particular unions uh, that might be closed? How do we open up those kinds of opportunities uh, for Austin residents to benefit from? And so the recommendation uh, then is to build upon Austin's existing cultural infrastructure to develop asset-based arts, cultural and heritage institutions of color. When we look at tourism, for example, and we want to showcase to tourists the, the, the heritage of um, the Latino communities, the heritage of African-American communities, there are no institutions, there are no specific places where you can send people, um, where we can guide tours, where we can see on an ongoing basis um, the legacy and heritage of African-American artists. There are a few city-owned spaces um, the, that may be part of the Park Department. Uh, the Cultural Affairs Division has the African-American Cultural Center. Um, but we think that there is a reason to think much bigger about those kinds of institutions in the city. We want to build employment opportunities in the creative sector under this recommendation, as we said. And we want to create an environment that welcomes tourists to take part in Austin's multifaceted creative industries. That is going to take absolute intentional work. Um, whether that means working with external partners, whether that means funding very specific um, organizational development planning. Uh, we need to build on what's already here and, and expand that work. And the third observation has to do with policy versus practice. And we know that public and private sector choices have shaped Austin's cultural life and determined whose culture is made visible, whose voices count when distributing hot tax funding, whose heritage is preserved and protected, and who has access. And this, none of this that I'm saying to you um, is, is being said uh, from a point of view, from a punitive point of view. It's being said from a point of view that will allow Austin to truly show case the creativity of all of its artists. Without a cultural policy, without a statement, without some guiding principles, um, without these agreements, we're going to continue to allow practices to shape the programs that, that are supported in our city. Because we've always done things a certain way does not mean that we have to continue to do things in that way. And that's where change management is part of the conversation here. We're going to have to adopt a mindset that there are artists and communities of color that have been excluded from funding opportunities. And how do we reshape those policies by reshaping the practices? And so the final recommendation is a policy recommendation to operationalize a policy-based plan. And when we start talking about policy, we're also talking about redistribution of financial resources that are designated for the arts, that are designated for culture and heritage and for music with an intentional focus on equity and inclusion. And for those of you who are grant seekers, um, this does mean that guidelines are going to need to be adjusted. Priorities will need to be made. How we give um, points on a scoring system are going to need to look a little bit different. But at the same time, we're going to have to attend to the deficits that we have in the grant making process. And I'm happy to say that we've been working with the staff across the three divisions um, and with the um, Office of Design and Delivery 
to look at how we can eliminate some of the processes that are redundant and still adhere to uh, the requirements that the city um, has to keep in place to be accountable to the public. So these three high level recommendations um, are being um, examined against a great deal of conversations, a lot of sensitive and frustrating conversations that we have with the public. Um, we're not here to talk about dismantling the cultural system in Austin. We're talking about completing the picture and making sure that for those organizations that historically have received um, funding from the city, that those organizations also have to rethink their commitment to racial equity. We're going to um, open it up now for um, more conversations. I'm turning it over to um, the city staff. So we have some questions lined up. I'll, I will go through and read them and then Margie will answer them and then we'll move on to questions that are from the chat. So feel free to continue adding your questions to the chat and we'll make sure we get to them. Who is deciding what this new equitable program looks like and how will it be vetted or evaluated? This is a question that came up uh, quite a bit during our uh, listening sessions. Who is going to decide? I think the public is deciding as we speak and having this opportunity to broaden the stakeholders and, and bring in more voices to this conversation is guiding these conversations about not what this new program looks like, but what does the city's approach to racial equity look like as it relates to arts and cultural funding. And so the public is deciding. And in this case, we're actually stopping to listen to um, some of those comments that, that were really kind of heartbreaking where you have legacy organizations of color in the city that are still in a um, category where they're competing against each other for funding. Um, and so, you have three teams of professional arts administrators that work for the city. Um, and so we've been working with those professional arts administrators to think about lowering barriers, to think about where redundancies exist. And we'll be bringing those, some of those ideas back to you um, over the next several months. We are a BIPOC organization. Are there specific plans to nurture and protect, ra protect racially diverse communities, especially communities that have been historically underinvested in? Um, I think this is absolutely uh, one of the primary goals of this review, um, is to look at uh, how organizations of color, BIPOC organizations and communities um, could be more successful in accessing city funds. Um, again, I want to repeat that this is um, an opportunity to strengthen the cultural system as a whole, not to dismantle it. So if we're able to allow ourselves to think of who has been uh, left out, who's not been able to access equally, who's not been at the table, which organizations have not been able to grow and flourish, um, that's the addition to this conversation that we're trying to do to raise. And so particularly as we moved around the city um, and looked at the scarcity of facilities and spaces um, where artists of color were able to um, have access to, where neighbors were able to participate in cultural programming within their neighborhoods, um, I think this is where the idea of nurturing and protecting our racially diverse communities is coming into play. And I don't think it's a secret, and it's certainly not my, uh, I'm not the first one to discover. We read a lot of articles about the declining population um, of Austin's African American and Latino communities. Um, and so I think this is one of the ways that the city can help respond to that, is this idea of nurturing um, artists and nurturing organizations that are legacy organizations um, that contribute to the city's uh, diversity. My organization is white-led. How will we be impacted by these equity changes? I think the impact will depend on each organization 
and their willingness and ability to participate in these conversations in open and honest ways. Um, it would be easy to say, to just talk about this from how many dollars you gain or lose. But I'm hoping that we can see as a community that this conversation has, an op has um, the ability to raise all boats. So we're not defining whether the organization is white led if there's some work they cannot do. We're saying that equity is a community problem. It's a community conversation and there has to be a community response. So your organizations are going to be impacted in the ways that you determine you're willing to participate um, in looking at new ways to be inclusive. Is there a way that a white led organization can do the work to be more equitable and will the economic development department provide us with training. Yes, yes, yes and yes. Absolutely, there are ways that all arts organizations can be more equitable across the board white led or BIPOC led. Um, and one of our primary goals is to think about what services and resources the cultural sector will need um, to do that work. Listen, this is not a conversation about how many different ways we can split a hair. Um, it's about how do we work together to make the creative sector uh, more accessible and equitable as a whole. Um, and so maybe this is an opportunity for us to um, participate in some uh, equity training, racial equity workshops, to gain the language that you've been asking for. Um, and the Economic Development Department is committed to, to, do, to providing those kinds of resources. Uh, my organization is white-led, but we are LGBTQIA or a member of the disability community. So what about equity for us? I think um, in this case, equity for uh, members of disability communities or LGBTQIA communities is certainly um, a priority and certainly important for us to have a discussion about. Um, but for the purposes of this conversation, um, it will be important for us to focus on racial equity. Uh, it's difficult uh, sometimes to say those things because it raises a red flag that what about me, you're leaving me out. But the city has determined um, that artists of color, communities of color, um, culturally specific organizations um, have not had uh, an opportunity to receive funding in equitable ways um, for a number of years. And so while we are not dismissing the need to think about equity across the board, we are focusing this work on racial equity. Will there be opportunity for comments on program drafts before they're finalized? And how do I find out about upcoming events? Information for that's on the next slide. So right now we, we've recently relaunched this effort. So July, August, and September, we've really revamped this, uh, this effort. Throughout October, November, and December, we'll be drafting our programs according to Marty's recommendations that she's outlined for you today. And then January through March, we'll continue to refine that draft program or those draft programs um, on time for a launch in March of 2020. So if you want to stay informed about this process, you can go to that um, web link right there, bit.ly slash funding review. Um, also through your Eventbrite registration, you'll receive email notices about feedback opportunities. Um, we have a few more events just like tonight in this series. And then after we have our programs drafted, we'll have a second phase of public feedback engagements where you'll actually get to see our plans and leave comments. Um, so that's it for our kind of anticipated questions. So I'll move on to audience questions. And we might not necessarily get to these in order. We might um, group some of them by theme. So have we explored diversifying funds for the city? So moving away from hot funding only and 
um, moving away from just tourism related funding options. And that is a question I'll hand off to Margie. We certainly have had conversations about how the city could leverage um, its funding and encourage more private sector contributions to support the arts. Um, that's a much bigger uh, legislative kind of conversation. Um, we don't want to get distracted from the work that we're intended to do here, which is to think about how we can use um, the hot tax funds in more efficient and effective ways to support the cultural sector. I think that conversation uh, will require more private sector individuals like yourselves to raise um, with private sector donors. I think there are opportunities that the city could um, do some subcontracting with um, private sector organizations, but, but we, we don't wanna, we, we really need to stay focused on these three divisions and the source of funding and how they're allocated uh, between cultural arts division, heritage preservation and music and entertainment. Otherwise we could get, as you can imagine, uh, that could be another year's worth of study. Um, so let's see if we can get to that uh, by looking at how we can be more efficient with the resources that we have. And how is equity attained when you ask about race and orientation and why not exclude that question altogether? Say that again. Uh, how, is, how is equity attained when you ask about race and orientation and why not exclude that question altogether? Um, that's one I might have to think about because I'm not real sure that I know how to answer that. And what is the definition of cultural arts in Austin? Um, I can speak briefly to that and then I'll hand it off to Jesus to see if he has anything to add. But we do, there is actually in the hotel occupancy tax ordinance a definition of what qualifies for art in that definition. Um, Jesus is is there anything you want to add to that? Um, I think that's a good definition. It's very broad on what is included. And I believe in the state statute, it says, for example, so that's not even necessarily exclusive what's listed in the state statute. Um, music and entertainment obviously is music focused. Um, heritage tourism is heritage and preservation. Uh, and in the cultural arts division, we fund all different types of artistic disciplines. So again, cultural arts is defined very broadly. So next question, have we considered the creation of a special portion of our funding to encourage collaboration on top of funding diverse projects um, to help our sector cross pollinate? And Margie, I'll throw that to you. I think that's definitely going to be something that you will see um, in the implementation strategies is the encouragement of collaboration. Um, I might hesitate right now to think about additional funding for, for that kind of category. Again, um, we, we don't want to continue to create um, these sort of short-term relationships. So if we add more money to something, then there will be a rush to building collaborations, but they may not be as um, long-standing or authentic as they might be if we understood how collaborating among different sizes, uh, focus areas, you know, within different partnerships to, to be, to create a more intrinsic kind of a relationship. So I'm not, a, as an old bureaucrat, I'm not that interested in adding another funding carrot as much as I am in, in asking organizations to see how their service to the community would be strengthened by collaborating with other organizations. So since equity has been mentioned for over two years in grant applications as a required commitment of the grantee, do the recommendations mention a commitment in the city contracts with grantees? Um, for example, the equity and inclusion clause brought up to the Arts Commission in April. Uh, Jesus? There we go. Um, these are still being um, 
um, planned out. So I think it could include something like that. Um, and I know that that has been brought up at the Arts Commission before. So as we're, as Margie kind of mentioned earlier, we're looking at what the points would look like for, you know, when an application is scored. So I think there is room for that and we'll explore that as we're creating the guide. And there seems to be a focus on artists and arts organizations. How are sites and resources that reflect the general heritage and history of people of color being included in these recommendations? Um, Margie. Thank you for that question. Um, we have been having a really deep and robust conversations with heritage tourism uh, because we, we also believe and understand that <clears throat> spaces, uh, infrastructure, um, historic uh, spaces are really important, uh, important part of the cultural system. Um, so working with Melissa and her team, as well as with the Landmark Commission, to um, look at how to lower barriers to um, accessing historic preservation designations, um, to looking at even having the community identify the kinds of spaces that need to be protected. Um, this is a really big point in Austin. Uh, again, there's a lot of development that has already happened that's, that's kind of um, shaken the, some of the neighborhoods up, but we do have an intent uh, to continue to think about, particularly with um, the grant programs that historic tourism, heritage tourism offers, um, to think about how we can do a better job preserving those spaces um, and calling attention to them as living um, assets in a community. So uh, that was not mentioned as much by me, my error, but indeed uh, looking at historic spaces and places is really a critical part of this review. And I'm going to go back to Jesus for a second um, about that commitments towards equity, uh, a clarifying question. Once someone is funded, will they sign a contract that includes a clause mandating that they carry those commitments to equity through? We have had discussions on that, on whether that would be part of the application process, whether that would be part of the contract process. So again, we don't have a definitive answer, but that is something we are uh, robustly discussing to see when and where and how, um, if we do institute something like that, uh, the manner we would go about and do it. Um, let me see. Since music is new to HOT funding and the live music fund has not even launched yet, it sounds like most of the data and history discussed here is based on arts and heritage. Did you mention, oh, but we did mention some discussions. Can you elaborate on the talks with the music organizations you mentioned? When did they take place? Will there be more? Um, Erica, would you like to take that question? Yes, hi everybody. Uh, Erica Shamley, Division Manager for Music and Entertainment. Um, we do have the Live Music Fund working group that had been meeting uh, prior to the pandemic and are starting to meet again to provide their recommendations. Um, they have met with Margie. Margie has um, also presented to the Music Commission a couple of times as well as listened in to a lot of the working group uh, conversations. So um, anything related specifically to these issues around the music industry, venues and musicians, has been uh, collected and will be reflected in what we present back um, you know, as a collective department. Okay, and let me see. Do we have any data or sources of data that reflects the amount of cultural arts funding the city has given marginalized communities to date? Jesus? Yes, we do have information um, like that. So um, we keep track of it and we can give that information out. Um, we're working on getting that there, um, but we do track that information and have it available for a variety, definitely different racial and ethnic groups. I believe at least for a couple of years, we also have it for LGBTQIA and disability community members as well, um, but definitely lots of uh, racial and ethnicity um, down uh, uh, data. And going back to the question of the definition of cultural arts in Austin, 
Um, does that definition include tech development? And if so, why? Uh, Can I take a stab at that before Jesus gives a better answer? Um, this is again, something that we heard from uh, the music uh, commissioners. It does include tech development because again, the number of job opportunities uh, in the cultural system as a whole, we wanna think about all of the industries under arts, culture, and heritage. And I think there are some opportunities for um, funding and supporting, especially uh, young people uh, moving into the areas of tech development. I mean, you cannot, you, you, can't, you cannot continue to grow the music sector without professionals that understand um, sound design and um, you can't grow the theater division without understanding costume and lighting design. All of those, um, you know, there'd be a dozen of careers under the tech development industries. I think if we were able to really think about this, particularly since this is an economic development opportunity, I think we're able to think about how we can encourage young people um, and, and attract um, professional tech directors um, uh, into the city. I think that just further builds uh, the infrastructure of the cultural system uh, in the city. Um, so that's, that, that's the why I would think that tech development uh, should be a part of the work that we do uh, under these three divisions. And then Jesus, um, the sort of data that we do have av available, how do people find that? Um, we need to do a better job of getting that out there. Um, I think the best way to do that would be just to email me. My email address is on the screen right there. Um, you do not need to use the accent on the U. I don't know if that will actually come through if you try and do that. So. Um, it suits without the accent on the U. Pantel at austintexas.gov is the best way for us uh, to get that information for you. And then just uh, quickly going back to the tech um, question, I think it would depend on the, at least from the cultural funding, cultural arts division perspective, um, the artistic with what I'm looking for, how artistic it is. So, you know, maybe doing a podcast or doing, you know, we fund, fund film festivals, we fund short films. So if you're doing a podcast, if you're doing like virtual reality or augmented reality. Um, so if there is some type of artistic component in there, then I think that could be something uh, that could be eligible for funding. And the recent funding it says the recent COVID funding process, um, and I believe they're talking about our fiscal year 21 funding process with our equity framework. Um, that seemed to care more about the makeup of the staff of organizations than what they actually do at the organizations. So how will we balance the desire to increase equity within staff um, and what they actually do? And Jesus, I think, once again, I'll pass on to you. Okay. Um, I think, you know, again, we're looking to see, you know, with the FY21, it was a bridge year. And so we knew we were still undergoing the cultural funding review process. And so we wanted to um, move forward knowing we were moving forward with racial equity, but still also funding those who were there before. So just because that's the way we did it in the bridge year doesn't necessarily mean that's how it's going to be the way that we do it going forward. So I think we are still kind of looking at that to see, okay, um, it's the makeup of the board and the artists and um, the staff, but what about uh, places uh, that you're reaching or, or the work that you're doing? So how do we incorporate that into the guidelines and you know, make that possibly a scoring component? So that is something we will be looking at. Um, I see that someone has asked, will the revenue application tiers change from this initiative? And I'll just answer that one. We don't have that sort of detail yet. Um, but if you come back to our second phase of public feedback and engagement, then we'll be able to share what sort of changes, what sort of specific changes to specific programs you can expect. Um, so our organization would like to partner with BIPOC organizations. How do we contact organizations interested, interested in partnerships? Um, they, 
this organization in particular would love to help with marketing um, and to participate in diversity training. I, I think I'll just focus us back on the first question. How do organizations find other organizations to partner? Um, I'll hand that to Margie for now. Well, I want to be real, real um, basic and honest with you about finding a partner. Um, I can imagine that there is a roster of city funded organization that exists uh, within the economic development department. I think looking for a partner um, should be preceded by um, thinking through what role the partner will play. Um, what is the gap within your own organization or what is the asset that you're looking to, um, to, um, to bring into your work. So thinking about partnerships, there may be, that may be something, again, I'm saying this out loud so that staff team can help me dig into this more, but thinking about going out to look for a BIPOC partner before you determine what resources you're looking for that partner to bring um, might, uh, might, might not be the right approach. Um, so I think it's really important and exciting that this conversation about collaborations is coming up. Uh, but let's think about what we want to learn from a partner, um, what assets we want to share mutually. Um, so there's a lot that goes into thinking about an authentic partnership um, before we just label the partnership being one that is going to help us check the box. But I think that there is a level of sincerity um, that we want to encourage and keep that going. Uh, so let's think more about how we can create a template for what a good partnership looks like. Maybe that's a resource we can provide. And I read the rest of this particular comment and I see that this person is, has some really specific requests for training. Um, and I just want to add too that in our, uh, in our brainstorm discussions with the all three division staff, we have been talking a lot about how we can serve as a connector and what sort of skills specific trainings might be of interest to our community, um, what sort of formats that might be. So we are looking very holistically at what we can do to support um, institutional growth and professional growth within our sectors. Um, and it's not just about a funding program. We, we're very much looking at large picture needs. Um, so let me see. Um, somebody has mentioned that there is not much representation of people from the music industry. Um, that's, that's a comment, but I want to throw that to Margie since, so we can speak a little more to our, um, the rest of our outreach plan. Tell me the question again. I'm trying to keep up with the chat and, and my brain is not able to do both things. Yep. So tell me the question again. Yeah, so this person is asking basically how we'll, um, how we plan on engaging more people from the music sector. Well, I don't think the music sector is uh, an outlier. I think uh, artists are artists. Um, and so whether I have failed to name the music division in this conversation specifically, um, that's my error but certainly musicians are a huge part of Austin's identity. Um, and musicians of all um, uh, genres, all cultural and ethnic backgrounds, all traditions, is part of what makes Austin the special place that it is. So we have a deep and abiding interest um, in looking for more ways to support uh, musicians in the city. And, and let me quickly say this, that the Music Commission and the musicians that we've been hearing from um, are helping us think about different models of funding uh, because many musicians operate in a nonprofit um, world underneath the 501c3 umbrella. But for those individual musicians and musicians that lean more toward um, an enterprising and commercial uh, work plan, I think we're also seeing and learning the importance of deepening our commitment again toward racial equity uh, in servicing those musicians as well. So I think we will be leaning in to try to think about how we service both models of, of artistic uh, outputs 
uh, without sacrificing, you know, certainly inequality. Um, and I think you've already seen the city step forward in supporting um, the commercial side of the music industry in the city already. So I just think that more work and more thinking will need to be done, but we certainly are committed to, um, to thinking about that. Uh, we are at 7.56, so I'm going to wrap up with a, just a, one last comment towards the rest of these questions. Um, I'm seeing interest in equity training. I'm seeing interest in um, seeing more of a, a connection with the tech industry so that we can leverage that more. Um, I'm also seeing comments about rent control and um, some space needs. And just to go back to, we, we really are taking all of that into consideration. Um, we're having conversations on how we can assist organizations in obtaining assets. And um, we, we are considering different ways that we can support people's uh, equity work within your own organizations. Um, and we, are, we also recognize that our staff can't do it all on our own and we've been talking about strategic partnerships that we can have to get some of that work off the ground. So um, a lot of this we have heard in previous um, sessions with our, with our stakeholders throughout this past year. Um, we've listened, we're having a lot of conversations on how we can uh, start to work on those things. So I'm going to direct you to this slide. If you have any questions about this presentation, I know somebody asked for um, host contact information. Any of that, you can contact Jesus at that email address or phone number there. Um, and you can find more information about this whole process on that funding review webpage linked in the center. Um, and this, we can have this presentation available in Spanish. So if you need that or if you have someone who's interested in that, um, again, reach out to his, um, any last Miko. comments? Oh, yeah. I want to uh, thank Margie again for this evening. Also want to acknowledge that the equity office is, has been listening in as well as our chief recovery officer, Veronica Bersinio and Su our assistant director, Susanna Carbajal. And we again are excited to work with Margie Rees and her team as we move forward towards um, a more intentional equitable model. And Margie, I'll let you have the last words. Well, I, I'm happy to have the next word because it won't be the last, will it? <laughs> yes, <laughs> no. Um, it's been so interesting uh, from our very first conversation uh, in town hall meeting in Austin to the one-on-one -on -one and individual conversations and to take this conversation through the last six months of isolation um, uh, from, from each other. Um, I think this has given us a real opportunity to rethink the greatness of Austin and the artists that live and make Austin their home and to rethink how we um, create a system to sustain the unique cultures of Austin, Texas and how we pay some attention to the fact that there are young artists uh, who are aggressively looking at new ways of doing things. Um, and so I think that what we will come back to you with in a few months, some very strategic and specific recommendations, hopefully will answer uh, many of the questions that you're having and thinking about right now. We're not done um, and we really appreciate the opportunity to work with such a welcoming staff. I have to say, uh, in many cities, we get a lot of pushback from staff, but you have a staff of arts administrators that are committed to working for you. And I appreciate your giving them some time uh, to do that. So thank you all for joining us. I know you'll have more questions. I um, mean, we look forward to hearing from you. All right. Have a good night, everybody.